Well, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was born in 1956, long, long time ago, <laughs> right when Rockabilly was starting. Um, I grew up, well, I lived in Memphis until I was three, I think. And we moved to California. Uh, we bought Johnny Carson's house in Encino, California when I was about three because dad wanted to move to California to be a movie star. So that he was... He had one movie under his belt and he wanted to be a movie star so <laughs> we moved to California. He had his eyes on the prize. I think Elvis had the same ambitions too. Yeah, Elvis did a lot more movies than dad did. But um, we moved to Encino and we lived there. We, like I said, we bought the house from Johnny Carson and we lived there for a while and then dad built this house between Ojai and Ventura, California, over a little town called Casita Springs. And it was on a mountain. And we lived there until they divorced when I was 10. And you had said that when your dad first built the property, they had to blast the side off a cliff to make room for the house. And yes, they did. <laughs> and our driveway was about a mile, maybe a mile and a half long, going winding up this hill. And, um, our house was built overlooking Casita Springs and behind it were all mountains and cliffs and um, that was a lot of fun when there were fires too. <laughs> we had two fires when we lived there. We were watering down the, the roof. I remember firemen coming up there and doing that. And you said that your mom had to chase off rattlesnakes with a pistol to, <laughs> to get them cleared out. Yeah, I don't know what Dad was thinking. Putting four kids and, a, and his wife on this mountain and going on the road, <laughs> but he had taught mom how to shoot. And uh, she put nine holes out of 12 into a six foot three rattlesnake that was coming out of our garage as we were driving in. And um, she shot several of them while we lived there. Uh, every size and every, uh, every size you can imagine. I, I'm deathly afraid of snakes, but they were always rattlesnakes. So none of the fun ones, all the, all the scary ones. All, <laughs> always think. a scary one. And your, your mom and dad met, was it at a roller skate rink? Yeah, my, there's a couple of stories, but mom told me that that, that dad told her later that he intentionally knocked her over. He knocked into her and made her fall down so that he could meet her. And, um, they skated and he asked if he could uh, take her home that night. So I think he took her home on the bus, her and her girlfriend. Uh, she had gone skating with her girlfriend. He was with the buddy. He was in a boot, what is it called? Boot camp. Boot camp, yeah. Um, in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, uh, so he went and took her home on the bus, got her phone number, and they saw each other for two or three weeks, I guess, before he shipped off. And they wrote over, I think we've got 1,100 letters between them. They wrote each other sometimes two and three times a day for four years. And we've got all of those letters. Mom saved every one of those letters. She saved everything he ever gave her with the date inside or the date on the item and where he gave it to her. You know, this was our fifth date or whatever it was. And uh, so we had quite a collection when mom passed and we found all these things in the back of her closet it was very sweet we even found her roller skates you found the roller skates i hope you kept them i kept them <laughs> i i actually got those and uh they're in my <laughs> they're waiting out there in the they're out waiting for me to come and get them so they're roller skating they're writing each other love letters your dad got posted in germany around that time landsberg was it landsberg germany and uh, he was there for four years. He was a um, Morse code operator. Um, in fact, he was the first American to find out that Stalin had been killed. Really? There, there's something I didn't know. He, uh, he heard it on the, the uh, whatever you call it, radio, uh, whatever it's called. He, I don't know. he heard the news. But he, I guess because of his ability to hear and, you know, 
sound and all that. He was an excellent Morse code operator, and they, he said it was like being in prison, that he'd be, have to be in this box of a room for eight hours a day, and uh, it was just him that would do that for eight hours. And did he ever learn German? I saw there was a German-English book that was at the Johnny Cash Museum. Downtown. Yeah, he, he spoke quite a bit of German. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, he spoke a little, uh, little Dutch, he spoke a little French. Um, he always made sure, whatever country he was going to, he always tried to learn at least a greeting and, uh, you know, I'm happy to be here or something like that in that language, which I thought was very sweet. And so he's in the military, he, he gets to go back home, and, and your folks got married almost right away, didn't they? I think he was home, I'm not real sure. I, I don't know when he got home, but they, they married on August 8th, 1954, I think. I think he got home in July or June. And, and then they were wed. And so his career starts to take off, and your mom, your mom Vivian, of course. Uh, well, we moved to Memphis, or they moved to Memphis, and Roseanne and I and Cindy were all born in Memphis. So we were there for, you know, at least five, six years. Well, really? I, I couldn't have been that old. Do you remember much of Memphis as a kid? I remember this tiny apartment, tiny apartment, and I remember that um, dad, I don't know if you have crystal hamburgers in Canada, probably not. We don't know. Okay, well, they're little hamburgers about this big and they have this tiny little hamburger inside the bun. And um, he used, to, back then you could get, let's see, what was it? You could get a burger for five cents. So on treat night, he would go buy a bag of these crystal burgers. And I remember that because that was like a big deal. Come home with a sack of hamburgers. Yeah, if he came home with a sack of crystal burgers, it was like a treat, you know. And I remember that. That's about all I remember. I was pretty small. Right. And then, and then you guys moved off to California. Then we moved to Encino. And Johnny Cash, or you guys, Johnny Cash has Johnny Carson's house all of a sudden. Yep. So do you remember that house? Oh, I remember that house well. We had a swimming pool. Mom made sure that we took lessons so we could swim like fish when we were very little. We had a monkey. We had a uh, Irish setter. We had a, um, our monkey's name was, was Homer. Our Irish setter was Penny Cash. And our parrot was Jethro. <laughs> That must so have been exciting. quite a wild experience having a monkey in the house. Can you imagine my mom with three little girls, dad's on the road, she's got a monkey, a parrot, an Irish setter, and us, and we're all under the age of five. Uh, no, I think my wife would not be very happy with me. <laughs> and, but I, it was so hilarious because it was, it was a great part of my childhood. That little monkey, Homer, had this little red... <laughs> Red cowboy hat. <laughs> what? <laughs> and he would put it on himself, and he would get on Penny and ride her around. <laughs> the, you know, Kathy. We thought that was just so hilarious. <laughs> How do you tell your friends at school what's going on at home? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I wasn't in school yet. I oh, just so thought we were crazy. A monkey with the cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But Jethro was a great aunt. We had him for, we ended up having him for, gosh, 18, 16 years or something. He had a vocabulary of over 250 words. The parrots live a long time. And he, well, he also mimicked my mom's voice, so he would call us in. And, Roseanne, Kathy, get it, Kathleen, get in this house. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd go running in and we'd say, what? What do you want? And Mom would say, I didn't call you Jethro. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, but while you're here, there's dishes you doing. <laughs> it was pretty funny. He, he was really funny. And he'd, he'd go, uh, he'd go, Vivian, Vivian. You know, she'd say, what, Jethro? Vivian want uh, Polly, uh, no, he'd say, Jethro wants cracker. Jethro <laughs> wants cracker. 
he'd, he'd cry like Cindy. She was a baby at the time and he'd mimic her cry. So mom would go running into the nursery and Cindy was asleep. He was, he was a lot of fun. Well, well Probably I can... not for mom, but for us he was. <laughs> <laughs> so your your mom's got to be a, had to have been a very patient lady. Well, I think that's why she was so tiny. She ran her legs off. She uh, she was patient, but I can't imagine doing all that. In the pictures, I mean, it, your mom is a very lovely lady, but she must have been quite petite too. Her waist was twenty two. Twenty two. And how tall was she? Five five. Okay, so you're you're didn't you're a little shorter than your mom, I guess then. Yeah, my mom is uh, was a towering five five. I'm five two, but she uh, she weighed about ninety seven the whole time I was a kid. Wow, she was tiny. So we've got monkeys wearing cowboy hat. You know, typical childhood. And uh, and so, what was it like when dad would when when your dad would come home off the road and and uh, oh, you guys were all together? Oh, he always came home with, with presents for all of us and something for mom, obviously, and. Uh, He'd try to get Jethro to sit on his finger, and Jethro would always go to mom, and that would frustrate him so bad. He'd say, "I bought Jethro for for me to for me to teach him stuff." And she said, "Well, you got to be here for him to get to know you." So he'd always hop to mom's finger when he'd get out. But um, dad was a lot of fun, you know. And uh, until one day, he just wasn't. <laughs> He was a lot of fun. He was a, a big present giver and a, a cuddler, and you know he liked to throw us in bed. We'd always he'd always come in and sing, um, pick a bale of cotton. So we'd jump on our beds and well he'd sing pick jump down turn around pick a bale of cotton. So we'd jump down turn, turn around. around pick a bale of, and then he'd say jump down turn around pick a bale of hay. Pick a bell, pick a bell, pick a bell of cotton, and then he'd throw us in bed. <laughs> and it was so much fun. He did that some kind of song every night for us. So it was usually pick, pick a bell of cotton. And did your mom, was she musical at all? She played the piano. Uh, she always said, I can't sing or the lick, but I can play the piano. But um, she, yeah, she played the piano and she was quite good. Would she play and your dad play at the same time or? Yeah, in fact, we've got a picture somewhere of mom playing piano, dad playing guitar, and Roseanne, Cindy, and, and me standing there singing. Uh, I just saw that picture yesterday somewhere. Well, it's got to be around here somewhere. <laughs> you know what? I think it was actually on Facebook. Yeah. Somebody posted it. I had never seen it before. I've, I see pictures all the time that I've never seen before of my family and dad. Well, I mean... I'm sure your dad was photographed many times over the years. Yeah, a few million times, I'm sure. And your your mom's family um, had sort of a background with uh, with food as well, right? You were you were kind of saying that the the family business was Italian food and specialties and. Um... Right. My great grandfather came over from Sicily, and brought my grandpa. I think he was three at the time. And they moved to San Antonio, Texas. And he became a, a very well-known grocer. Grocer, he uh, opened a grocery store, and um, I think they even made specialty foods in there. I'm not sure. I'm not positive about that. But um, then my grandmother, and I don't know if this was after she had my mom and everyone, or if it was before, but she ended up. Um, canning her on spaghetti sauce and meatballs. And I've got the label of the meatballs uh, in my house that's framed and in the house. Mom gave us all one, one year for Christmas. She was so excited because she thought all the labels had been gone forever and she found a stack of them. Wow. So that was a great Christmas present that year. So when you go to grandma and grandpa's house on your mom's side, was there always good Italian food waiting for you? Oh God, yes, so much. What was your favorite thing that your uh, grandparents used to make when you'd go over there? Spaghetti and meatballs. Spaghetti and meatballs. But they didn't They didn't drop it out of the can. They made it probably fresh for no, you. No, it was never out of the can. <laughs> Here we, here's one of our cans of spaghetti and meatballs. My mom used to cook spaghetti sauce every Sunday for hours. Every Sunday. And uh, 
It was so good. Probably the smell in the kitchen. She started early in the morning, and by the time we got home from church, it was ready. You know, an hour or so after we got home from church, but it, it would simmer all day. It was so good. Well, she probably had no idea that meeting the uh, the cute guy at the roller rink would lead to a monkey wearing a cowboy hat. And <laughs> I don't think so. I think she knew she was in for some fun, though. He was a lot of fun. We've got pictures of him that he sent to her when he was over in the service of him. You know, like, there's a picture of mom on the wall above his bunk, and he's going like this. You know, like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> over her picture. And then another one where he's kissing it and you know he sent her pictures like that all the time and you were saying that your your folks even though sadly things didn't end up they didn't end up staying together but they stayed friends for their whole lives yeah i've got a picture of them um together uh, mom went to see dad it was july 12th it was my son dustin's birthday july 12th 2003 June died May 5th, May 15th, I think. And uh, mom came to see dad in July to ask permission for, um, if he would give his permission for her to write a book. And he said, you don't need my permission. He said, of all people in the whole world, you're the one that should write one. And um, she started crying. She thought that meant so much to her that he gave his consent. So they visited for a couple of hours and um, then dad wanted to celebrate Dustin's birthday. So we all hung out and visited for like the whole day, my sisters and all of us. And your mom wrote the book and it's I Walked the Lion, right? Right. Which she did. <laughs> In fact, wasn't I Walked the Lion, was it written for your mom? Yeah, that yeah. song was written for mom in 1954, I think, and it was, I. I know it wasn't Dad's first hit, but I, I think it was his second or third hit. One of his most iconic songs. Yeah. And uh, so she she wrote her book, um, and it, it was basically just kind of giving her backstory to to their relationship and how things happened, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, the letters. Several of the letters are in there that they wrote to each other, and um, she tells her whole story and. Really sadly, she didn't get to see the book published. She was almost finished with it when she died. So it, it did end up getting published, and obviously, and put out there. I believe it's still available on Amazon. It's called I Walk the Line. And, um, but she didn't get to see it finished. So what were, you, what were the biggest surprises that you got out of reading your mom's book? Because there were some stories in there you said that she hadn't even told you. I know, and I... I'm trying to remember because there were two or three things in there. I was like, really, Mom? Um, you know, you caught me off guard, Alex. Well, that's okay. I, I mean, think of anything right this second because... But this would be a great opportunity if people go out and order that book on Amazon <laughs> and they can yeah, read it and it, hear the stories. It's really good and it's very sweet. She's always been so loving about him. She never stopped loving him. So it's very respectable book too it's not you know it's nothing trash talking none of that no of course and as we were saying she was always very supportive of his art and his music and and what he was doing always yeah it, and it seemed like very much in love and very much friends from the beginning right to the end she loved him from the day she met him until the day she died and she told me that and so you have a talented family as well your, your oldest son, a musician, Thomas Gabriel. And if, if somebody is watching this and they haven't listened to Kathy's son, Thomas, you should, because he has um, a very familiar sounding voice. He's inherited your dad's vocal cords, it seems. It's really, it's, you know, I've closed my eyes a couple of times and thought, that is dad. And he does sound a lot like dad, but um, he's got his own style and he's really good. His name is Thomas Gabriel. And uh, he's on Facebook, he's on um, he's on Instagram a little bit, but mostly Facebook. And uh, it's Thomas Gabriel official, I think. is the... Yeah, I've heard some of his music. He, he writes his own stuff. He's got a great Western vibe going on. And um, you, your other son is also a, a filmmaker? 
Dustin is a filmmaker. He's the one that actually put out uh, with Matt Riddle, who were, uh, his husband, he put out uh, My Darling Vivian, which is my mom's documentary. And it's pretty amazing. It's full of family footage and um, so much memorabilia. And so it's basically, it's interviews of Roseanne, me, Cindy and Tara me and my three sisters um, talking about mom and a lot of family footage of mom and dad in their early years and when we were little. It's it's really a beautiful film. I can't watch it without crying and of course I'm attached to it, but it's, it's pretty strange how many strangers said I cried and cried when I saw this documentary. It's so beautiful. And you've also been in front of the camera as well. Um, <laughs> your son put you in a movie. Yes. What's the did. matter with Gerald? What's the matter with Gerald? And I don't really talk like a sailor, <laughs> but um, it was based, it's that movie, my character is based on a real person. So I played this real person and that's how she talks. So forgive me, don't watch What's the Matter with Gerald in front of your children. <laughs> but it is a good story. I thought it was. I don't know if you've seen it, but I thought it was a good story. And it was a lot of fun. I got some good reviews from that, too. I was pretty surprised. See? There you go. So they'll have to start casting you in some more stuff. <laughs> yeah, that'd be all right. Let's see what happens. Yeah. But, um, no, I guess, you know, as we sit here and it's, you know, hearing these wonderful stories about your childhood and growing up and... You know, it's almost surreal uh, living in Johnny Carson's old house and you got a monkey with a cowboy hat running around. Um, what were some of maybe your favorite memories of, of childhood that uh, that you could share with us? Some of like maybe a nice little story of something you recall. Well, one time, uh, remember, Christmas was a huge deal at our house. Mom always made this big deal out of Christmas and we came running through down the hall, all the bedrooms were down a hall, and then there was a door that locked so that all the bedrooms were locked in at night, you know, and the rest of the house was uh, on the other wing. So we came running down and uh, we come out and from the fireplace in the den, which is a brick floor, there are black boot marks from the fireplace Christmas morning all the way into the entry hall and onto the white carpet in the living room all the way to the Christmas tree. And I thought that was the coolest thing that Santa had been to our house and we could see exactly where he was. And he made a mess. <laughs> and we didn't understand why mom was like, you know, very... She wasn't real happy yeah, about that it. that was really cute. You know, kind of. <laughs> and I thought, well, I wonder why she's not excited that Santa came in here and did this and you know obviously found out later that dad thought that was really a cool thing to do but oh wait i thought you were going to say your dad was actually santa claus <laughs> <laughs> no we just saw his boot marks all the way. <laughs> but the carpet in the living room mom had that cleaned every month every month it was cleaned and we had the paper that we had to walk on you know if we wanted to go in there so that did not make her very happy but that was one of my favorite memories that was exciting and then, um, let's see, uh, there's so many. Well, I, I heard, I was watching an old interview with your dad where they kind of surprised him. He thought he was doing a concert, but really it was the uh, This Is Your Life, Johnny Cash, oh. that, which I, I heard caught him off guard a little bit. <laughs> he wasn't expecting that. Well, you know what's funny about that show? <laughs> My sisters and I watched it a few years ago and we were like, this is, <laughs> it should have been called this is your sad, pathetic life, Johnny Cash. <laughs> because the host was talking about all these awful things. <laughs> yeah, he kind of really got into the, you know, the marriage the business. And, the, and yeah. all of the, and I thought, they need to rename the show. This is just, you know, this is not cool. But I remember filming that part. You know, they gave us our lines. And I thought that was kind of lame. I thought, why can't I say what I want to, to my dad? And, uh, they had their plan. But there was one story that stood out to me about your dad on a whim bought a whole bunch of baby chickens. <laughs> dad used to get bored in hotel rooms. So he painted one black. 
he decided that he needed an adjoining room with his uh, bass player Marshall one night, so he chopped a hole through the wall with an axe. Um, another time, he left 500 baby chickens in a hotel room. 500? 500. Because a dozen isn't enough. Oh no, not a dozen. <laughs> and then, I don't know if it was that same trip or what, but he brought home six baby chickens for us. And um, that wasn't a really good idea because we had a German Shepherd at the time. And, <laughs> and the German Shepherd's water bowl was really big and the baby chicks were not. And we right. found a couple of them belly up, which is oh, no. really sad. So. But yeah, I can only imagine what his bandmates thought when they get back from whatever they're doing and find out that your dad had brought home 500 chickens and put them in a hotel room. Oh, I can't imagine. I, I don't know, a couple, they probably weren't surprised after a while. They probably were just like, what, what's next? Well, it, what's surprising me is that, that Western musicians are a fair bit uh, more rough and rowdy than even rock and roll musicians are. Yeah, but... Um, these guys weren't. <laughs> That's what was so funny. Is they were uh, Marshall never drank, smoked, did anything, and I don't know about Luther. I think he drank a little bit. I know he smoked like a chimney, but um, Dad was the wild one. So <laughs> your mom, she's going through all this. Uh, there's monkeys. There's chickens. There's what, what's the what's the thing that probably surprised you the most being being a, a kid that uh, your dad might have done? Ride my bicycle down the driveway at midnight one night and the neighbor said, I saw your dad riding your bicycle down the driveway. I was like... Oh. And how, how old were you at that time? I was in school, so I was probably seven. So six, seven, it, it would have been a bike much too small for him then. Of course it was. <laughs> His long legs just... He was out of control. Well, it seemed like he liked to have fun. He did like to have fun, but... And another thing he did is he thought that he... The people in Casita Springs would really enjoy his Christmas music because he liked to play Bing Crosby and all these classic Christmas things. So he put these huge speakers on our roof and a sound system and played it for Casita Springs <laughs> and these... I guess he had enough complaints to where the police came up and made him turn it off. He was so bummed out. He was like, I, I thought they would enjoy that. Right. I mean, we went, he took us one night driving all the way around to Foster Park, which was a long way from our house, but it was parallel. And there's a lake in between, and then there's a town in between. And you could hear the music. It was that far away. That's how far, yes, that's how loud it was. And this was your mountain home, so it's probably bouncing off the mountain. Great acoustics up there. Yeah, and mom was like, you know, um, what time are you turning the music off tonight? So what did your mom's folks think of this whole setup? My mom's folks loved dad, loved him. They were very upset when they found out they were divorcing. In fact, my mom was so afraid to tell my grandparents because they were Catholic. So they read it in the paper that mom and dad were getting divorced. Right, and, and being Catholic, you're not really supposed to get divorced. And your dad, did he have to write a letter to the archdiocese or something to yes, get your did. mom back in? Yes, he did. And mom had to do a lot, run through a lot of hoops to get back into the Catholic church. But uh, she, she made it back. And I mean, it was nice of your dad at the end to kind of say, yeah, well, maybe she's got her reasons. Well, he wrote some, you know, this letter was basically the divorce was entirely my fault. Um, you know, I was not a good husband, blah, 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 blah. So that's how she got back into the. But ultimately they ended up patching things up to stay friends and, you know, wonderful daughters out of it and grandkids and, and life that carries on. Yeah. Oh, they loved each other. Yeah. So everybody should go out and buy your mom's book and they should watch the documentary. Oh, please watch the documentary. It's really good. It's so, it's so sweet. And you'll find out a lot about mom and mom and dad's marriage. They were married 14 years. So that's a, you know, it's a big part of dad's life. Substantial. And, um, a lot of people have tried to write mom out of his life and, uh, I think it's important that people know about her. 
Well, her story, in my opinion, is very, very interesting. And um, I, I think it's it's great that uh, your family has put out a documentary to kind of tell that side of the story, because you're right, the mainstream public doesn't really get a chance to hear that side too often. So, no, they don't. Yeah, so, and I, I just think it's uh, it, it's great that there's those resources out there now. And good on your mom for writing a book in in her older years to, to put pen to paper and start putting those thoughts down. And I agree. That legacy's out there now. Well, she was invisible for so long, you know, and she never gave an interview. In all of those years, 50 years, she never gave one interview. She wouldn't talk to anybody. They offered her money, they offered her the sky, and she would not give her story to anyone. Well, that's that's a sign of a, um, of a very classy lady who yeah. who decided to keep it, uh, keep, keep it private until she had permission to talk about it, so. That's right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today, Kathy. I love hearing these stories. Well, I'm so happy that you came here. I'm so glad to meet you in person. I feel like we were friends way before you got here anyway. so It made it easier. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again so much and uh, for inviting us in your lovely home. Sure, of course. Thanks.